I'm so glad to see you all here. Uh, this is our first event, author event, in our new store. So uh, this is uh, really, it's really, a, a, I'm, I'm just delighted uh, to have uh, John on here. And, uh, and, and I'm glad you all turned out. This is uh, a really happy day for us. So to introduce Jono, we have uh, Craig Lancaster, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Craig. Okay. Thanks, Mark. All right. Gianno Cromley was born and raised right here in Billings, where he graduated from senior high. He then went on to Dartmouth College. And he's totally not uppity about it. In fact, he's <laughs> magnanimous enough to hang out with a college dropout like me. And he worked in Washington, D.C. for Senator Max Baucus. He earned his MFA from the University of Montana. He's also not uppity about that. He's the author of a previous novel, The Last Good of Halloween, and a story collection, What We Build Upon the Ruins. They're both up here. And both of those were High Plains Book Award finalists, so you just know he has the chops. He is the recipient of an Artist's Fellowship from the Illinois Art Council, and he is an English professor at Kennedy King College in Chicago, where he is chair of the Communications Department. And he sits on the committee for the Center of Equity for Creative Arts. Tonight, we're here to celebrate his latest novel, the Prince of Infinite Space, and to celebrate Gianna, for this is a true homecoming. And I can't think of a better occasion for the first official event of this beautiful new bookstore, which has been such a labor of love for so many people. As we all know, sticking up for Billings in a cultural sense isn't always easy sledding. A lot of the artistic scene here is a little bit underground, a little hard to find, but those who do find it know how brightly it shines. Writers, visual artists, actors, musicians, woodworkers, whatever, you name it, Billings has some of the finest in the state, the region, the country. And when those artists, like Giano, go out into the world, they still belong to us. They're still part of our beating heart. He could have launched this book anywhere, but he came home. How lucky are we? Giano Cromley, everybody. Thank, thank you, Craig, for that introduction. I, I literally texted him an hour ago asking him to introduce me, and he just wrote something that brought me to tears. So uh, thank you, Craig. Um, I want to thank uh, Gus, Mark, Rosanna, everyone with the, this House of Books for putting this event together uh, for, for, for me and for this book. Um, you know, I was, um, I was looking at the, the mission for this House of Books earlier this week, and it, it reads, to build an independent, full-service bookstore in downtown Billings and turn it into a literary and cultural hub for the city. And that just pings so many of my interests and loves and passions, and uh, to be here for this, uh, for this launch of this book is really special to me. Um, so, Billings is very embedded into the DNA of this book into the DNA of this character. Um, it's where he's from, it was where he was raised. And so, again, just being here for this is really special. Because of that, I thought that I would kind of treat this like a living room conversation uh, this evening. Um, just kind of give you a little context about the book, its journey to this point, maybe do a little bit of reading about it. And then um, if anyone has any questions they want to ask me about it. I also, by the way, just want to thank everyone for coming here in this extreme heat. Uh, a lot of familiar faces, a lot of friendly faces. Um, so this is a real treat for me. So, um, so I'll go ahead and just kind of tell you a little bit about this book. Um, the idea for it, well, I mean, I'll tell you. The title of it is The Prince of Infinite Space. Um, the idea for it, does it sound OK? OK. Um, the idea for it uh, occurred to me in 2013. I had just finished, uh, found a publisher for my first novel, and there was a voice inside my head. It was Kirby Rousseau. It was the character from that first novel, and he was saying to me, 
this story isn't done yet. And, and shortly after that, the story came to me almost completely uh, told already, uh, which rarely happens for me, so it was kind of a strange circumstance. So I wrote this novel, and uh, I worked with my previous publisher uh, through multiple drafts, through which it got immeasurably better. Um, but ultimately, after maybe the third draft, we kind of had a disagreement about how these characters should wind up at the end of this, this book. And so we just decided to part ways. Um, so this book was kind of floating around in limbo for a little bit uh, until I finally, uh, this publisher out of Virginia called Propertius Press read it. And they fell in love with the story and, and said that they wanted to publish it. So uh, we had a couple of COVID delays. Uh, and so. <laughs> Here we are today, it was two, basically 2013, almost 10 years in the making. Um, but I think it's long gestation uh, really makes today a lot more gratifying. Um, so I'm really happy to be here and be able to share this, this time with you guys. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context about this book, I, I wrote this, even though it is technically a sequel, I wrote it so that I, I don't feel like you need to have a great deal of um, of, uh, you, have, you don't have to have read that first book in order to kind of understand what this is or what's happening here. Um, but I will give you a little bit, because I'm only reading a snippet of this, you might, might be helpful to know some background. Um, so uh, the events of, of The Prince of Infinite Space take place two years, after the event, uh, two years prior to uh, this novel taking uh, beginning. Uh, this novel starts in 1990 in the fall. Um, the country is on the brink of entering the first Gulf War. Um, for those of you who remember that, it was a very strange and interesting time. I think we kind of maybe forget about it in light of later events that, that happened. Um, Kirby is 17 years old at this point. As I indicated, he's, he's from Billings, but he is now uh, in a military academy in Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, which was kind of a threat that was looming. I don't, I don't want to spoil the first one. It was a threat that was looming in the first novel. Uh, he was raised by a single mother. Her name is Debbie. That's what he calls her. Um, a couple names you'll hear referenced uh, is Julian, um, who was a friend of his in The Last Good Halloween, and Izzy, who was a girlfriend of his um, who went missing in the last book. She will eventually become the focus of, of this book. Um, lastly, uh, he's never met his father before, um, something to just keep in mind. And his mom, Debbie, is dropping him off for the, his, the first day of his senior year at Military Academy. So uh, I think that's all you need to know in order to be dangerous for this. <laughs> Chapter 1. The peace was uneasy. But the treaty between my demons and me held. It has held. The Haverford Military Institute Cadet Squad is doing drills on the lacrosse field off in the distance. Fake wooden rifles spin like fan blades. At the apex of each revolution, something shiny on the rifles is catching the light, flashing a metallic strobe directly into my eyes, which in turn, is making them water. This is Debbie's last goodbye before she heads back to Billings. And the fact that I appear to be crying is, I think, artificially inflating her numbers on the maternal success index. For once, I'm OK with not initiating a market correction, even though a 17-year-old crying before the first day of military school is pretty much begging to get his ass kicked. Since getting shipped off to Haverford nearly two years ago, I've managed to purchase for myself a new, more sustainable outlook on life. I call this period the time of abiding. And it's allowed me to ditch the emotional freight that had been the cause of some of my more deviant behaviors. Of course, that's the chief reason a place like Haverford exists in the first place, to bring about the kind of turnaround they like to take credit for and obliquely refer to in their promotional materials. But I'd like to think I came upon and entered the time of abiding in a more organic, self-directed fashion. 
Haverford's school year runs long in the spring and starts up the second week in August. So I only got a month and some change at home before having to trund trundle back here for senior year. Not that I'm unhappy about that, mind you. There wasn't a hell of a lot for me to do in Billings. I'm still forbidden to hang out with Julian, his parents' wishes, and all efforts to get a hold of my former sort of girlfriend, Izzy, met with abject failure, which means I have zero friends in Billings, so I basically spend all my time at home. Debbie's boyfriend, Harley Doherty, still technically lives there, but he was hardly ever around, always giving vague work-related excuses for his absences. For those keeping score, Harley is Debbie's ninth boyfriend, including Bradley, Bradley Kellogg, whom she was married to for a while and who was the closest thing I ever had to an actual legitimate father figure. On the days Debbie didn't have work, she'd watch videotaped episodes of The Golden Girls nonstop. I, I sat through so many of those goddamn things, I feel like I know Dorothy Spornak better than Debbie at this point. I think the dissolution of her relationship with Harley might have finally eroded her last stronghold of hope. She's realized her fate, to love and lose, to never hold. The leader of the cadet squad barks out an order and rifles snap to a halt. The red berets are all tilted at the same 20 degree angle. They look so serious, I can't decide if it's admirable or terrifying. The irony is that all those flashing maneuvers aren't even standard military practice. It's purely for show, something they like parents to see when they drop their kids off because it's what they imagine military schools should look like. Right now, the cadet squad's working on the routine they'll do when they march in Bismarck's Harvest Days Parade. But anyone who knows anything about it knows it's a complete load of horseshit. I'm so proud of the way you've adapted, Kirby. Debbie sniffles once and touches her nose with a wad of Kleenex. You've grown so much. She's let her hair get long, but it doesn't look like she's doing anything with it. The cadet squad is standing at attention, like those monuments on Easter Island. Haverford's campus is situated at the top of a rounded hill just south of Bismarck, North Dakota. It's the only appreciable elevation for miles around, which in the pool table flat Midwest means this knoll constitutes a legitimate alpine experience. Personally, I don't much like living up here. It always leaves me feeling strangely exposed, like the sky might devour us whole at any moment, which, for the record, is exactly the kind of thing you want to avoid telling your therapist when you're trying to convince him your days of aberrant behavior are behind you. I mentioned it to Dr. Byrne this past summer, and he nearly put me on a regimen of Thorazine without a word more. Sanity, I've learned, is simply a matter of figuring out which thoughts you can tell to whom. <laughs> so what do you think? Debbie asks, and I realize I haven't been listening to her. It's quite possible, I say, because it's a good catch-all response. Okay then, she says, as if an important matter has just been settled. Then she puts her hands on my shoulders to signify a topic shift. This is it, kiddo, your senior year. I don't think the smart money had me making it this far, I say. Debbie winces but lets it go. Just keep working hard and I'll see you at Thanksgiving, yes? About that, I say. Once I'm named editor of the Bugle, I'll probably have to stay here over Turkey Day to make sure we get the December issue to press on time. Debbie's eyes go dull. She's also stopped wearing makeup, another sign that things with Harley are likely kaput. I told you this already, didn't I? I did. But Debbie's been so zoned out this summer, it's hard to know what's gotten through. I don't think so, she says, and looks off to the east, where the Missouri River slowly wends past the base of this hill 
on its way eventually to the Gulf of Mexico. Behind Debbie, a single file of lacrosse players rounds the administration building at a jog, wearing full pads and helmets, sticks held at their sides like lances. They're snaking their way to the lacrosse field where they'll soon displace the cadet squad since lacrosse ranks a couple links higher on the Haverford food chain. December's the most important issue we do, I say. It's the one we enter into competitions, so... She turns her tired face towards me again. Her hands feel like cinder blocks weighing down on my shoulders. Then her eyes brighten. Of course, I could come here for Thanksgiving. It's not like I have anything keeping me in Billings. It sounds so sad when she says it. I don't even try to shoot it down. Now listen, she says, adopting a more, a more business-like tone, which tells me she's about to deliver her annual academic psych-up speech. Let's build on this progress. Let's keep this momentum going. I have a feeling great things are in store for Kirby Rousseau this year. Tally-ho, I say, with enough enthusiasm that she buys it. The lacrosse team is winding its way past us, panting and grunting, pungent sweat wafting. Now, Debbie says, I'm going to get into that car and drive off, and I'm going to be strong and not cry until I'm out of sight. It's a deal, I tell her. But first, you know what I need, mister. She wants her first day of school kiss. On principle and by tradition, I'm committed to resisting this entreaty. Plus, the lacrosse team is right there. But since this is the last first day of school she's going to see me off to, and because the lacrosse team, to a man, would already love nothing more than to send me down the nearby Missouri in my own personal Viking funeral barge, with nary a flaxen-haired maiden to shed a tear, I give in and place an unembarrassed, heartfelt kissed kiss on Debbie's cheek. Her skin is rough but warm, and I realize she smells like me. Not because we spent the last six hours in the car together, but because at our cores, we share some similar chemical essence and our triumphs and our failures will likely always be entwined. A murmur of jeers rises up amongst the passing lacrosse players, but Debbie, Debbie is oblivious to it, probably because she's flummoxed by the fact that I didn't put up a fight. Oh, she says, touching her cheek. Give my best to Harley. Tell him I'm still glad Bush beat Dukakis. I will, she says unenthusiastically. Then she climbs into her Subaru, which still has the crooked bumper from when I tried to mow down our paper boy. <laughs> which, if you want to draw a map, was one of those crossroad events that brought my life to this exact circumstance. When she pulls out of the space in front of the barracks, I do a full arm side to side wave until she's out of sight. The lacrosse team has chased the cadet squad off the field in a bloodless coup. They're whipping hard rubber balls between the baskets of their sticks with such speed and precision, it seems like magic. Now that I'm alone on campus, my ear tips go tingly and a prickly sweat breaks out on my neck. Three deep breaths, two knuckle cracks, four tooth taps. It's a little ritual Dr. Byrne taught me to help calm myself down if situations threaten to get too big. I didn't mention to Debbie when she delivered her pep talk that this is the first year I've actually believed what she said. I am on the verge of greatness. Only one problem though. The more things start to go my way, the more I worry about what'll happen when they inevitably don't. So, yeah, there we go. No, it's good. It's good. So, uh, I guess I just would, you know, that was the reading. <laughs> uh, I wanted to have a chance if anyone has any questions or anything, to, you can go ahead and ask whatever. But otherwise, so, um, oh. I have a question. You yeah. grew up with such 
smart, talented, and proper parents, where did Debbie come from? <laughs> That's a great question. Fiction, Corby, fiction. Uh, of course, you say that with my dad just behind you, so that was very, I don't know how you planned well, it that way. It is very true. Yeah, no, it is, it is absolutely true. And, and I do sometimes get asked that. Uh, I think wayward parents might be a theme in my fiction, so it is truly not based on reality at all. Yeah, I, I, and I mean that, I'm not saying that just because my dad is here tonight. And my mom is watching on Facebook Live. <laughs> so, yeah. No, but it, it is, I, it, I, that is a theme I feel like I maybe am drawn to a little bit in, in terms of the characters that I have. I feel it, it, it provides an interesting present for them, you know, when they have that past that's, that's full of that. It's, it, it, it creates interesting ripples into the, the present and future, which I just find interesting to explore, I think. Yeah. In your first novel, I, I remember tasting Billings when I yeah. was reading it. I just remember just experiencing. So how much would you say of, of Kirby mm -hmm. do, you, do you draw from, not necessarily autobiographical, mm -hmm. but biographical sources from the people with which you grew up? Shh. Uh, that is a great question. I mean, you, you, yeah, The Last Good Halloween was just, I mean, it was very, very Billings-centric. I know, Rita, you are a big, a big fan of it. I appreciate it. Uh, it's, um, all of it is, it's based on memories, right? And it's, even if it's not something that I, that happened to me, it's something that happened to a friend or something I saw. And I mean, just the the smell and the sights and the, I mean, the light is different in Billings than it is other places. The, the air is different. Um, and I feel like all of that uh, really kind of goes, gets poured into the character. And, and with this new book, I mean, it, it, it ends in Billings. Um, it kind of starts in Bismarck and it travels. It's another road trip story. Um, but I feel like Billings is just encoded into his DNA in so many ways that it's, I mean, I just, I feel like when I think of him, I think of, of this place, you know? Yeah. I don't know if I answered a question or not. Okay, good. <laughs> so, um, if, there aren't, if, if there aren't any more questions, we can just sign books and hang out too. That's always good. good. Oh. So, I know you mentioned With the mm -hmm. early '90s, how do you use that in your book? To uh, does that affect the narrative, narrative at all? Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, are you done? Yeah. Or were you going to keep? Yeah. Going? So, like, how does that affect the narrative at all in your book? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, for those who maybe couldn't have heard on the live stream, uh, the the questioner asked about the time period, the setting, how that affects the story. And since this is set in 1990. Um, it was a very conscious choice to, to choose that time period, um, not only because I happened to be a senior in high school at that time, so it was pretty easy for me to draw on it, but I, I do think of it as um, kind of a, a, a secret pivot point in, in history that we don't really think about that much. We have, you know, we have some very big cultural, historical mile markers that we refer to. Um, and, and I don't think that is one that often gets thought of, but I do think it really set the table for what was to come in the 90s and then even, you know, in kind of a post 9-11 uh, United States. Um, and so I remember that time as being this kind of very rah-rah, um, like pro, like kind of rush into war, um, and there, I didn't feel like, and I, I mean, you know, this is probably, you know, from a 17-year-old's point of view, it didn't feel like anyone was stopping to ask if this was a good idea or if we should or what the long-term consequences might be. And, and I mean, I think that we, I personally think we paid the price for that a, a lot later on in, in, you know, subsequent years and decades. Um, and so... I do just remember that very, very kind of urgent drumbeat toward, toward what was almost inevitable. And I, I remember even in my head as a senior, uh, 
it just didn't even, I mean, Rini, we, we were on the school newspaper. I mean, you remember that, you know, just, I, I feel like we kind of were swept up in this, that, that fever in a way. And, and so I, I wanted to have a character who kind of, I think, instinctively was propelled by that, that was happening around him, but also was probably a little bit more cognizant of the wider world than me, than I was. And so was able to maybe see a little bit of the, the, the kind of fraying edges around what was happening. Um, so to me, I mean, the, the book, I mean, I'm not going to spoil the ending, but the book ends with kind of a, this, um, this, this quote, which actually, I mean, I guess I'll just spill it. Uh, <laughs> please buy the book still. <laughs> uh, where, I remember it was it was 1991, so it was the summer after we kind of had done. The, well, I guess it was yeah after the the war was over, and uh, and I, I was at this talk given by Peter Matheson, the the writer, and it was in this kind of very kind of pro-war crowd. I think Colin Powell had spoken earlier at this thing or something, and Schwarzkopf, Norman Schwarzkopf had some. Those are some deep pulls from the 90s there. The, the, the <laughs> name dropping. Uh, and he and he got up and he said something to the effect of, and I actually it's directly quoted in my book. But um, we need to ask ourselves if a war where uh, a, a, maybe a hundred people die on one side and a hundred thousand people die on the other side, is that a war or is that a massacre? Sure. And I remember in the room the oxygen just got sucked out of the room. And I, in my head, was like, holy shit. I was 18, so I was like, holy shit. Like, I had never thought of it like that before. And so, um, so I actually, I mean, I give credit to Peter Matheson in that, but I did actually li literally just pull that quote from that talk that he gave. Um, yeah. I don't know if that, I think I wandered way further than your question, but thank you for asking that. Yeah. I'd actually like to build off of that. Yeah. Beyond the impressionistic memories of that, mm -hmm. time, how accessible were the fine memories? Not that much older than you. Yeah. <laughs> you look a lot better. <laughs> um, and I find even back then, you know, I was two years out of high school in 1990. Mm -hmm. And I, mean, I can remember how I felt the night that you know President Bush went on TV and said. On. Yeah, yeah. But when I see pictures or I try to think of where was I going to eat and who was I with, mm -hmm. it seems so incredibly distant. Like, do you spend much time fortifying memory with, okay, you know, what were the places? Who, you know, sure. What were we wearing? You know, even that. Is like, yeah. That's a really, I think I really do try hard to kind of put myself as much as possible into that headspace. Um, it's very difficult. Um, and I think those moments and those times become less accessible as I approach your age. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, I'm sorry, I, just, I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. <laughs> It gets better, right? <laughs> uh, no, the um, it's funny because a, a couple people have asked me recently if I would write another book in this series, and my answer is like no, like never. Um, and I think part of it is, I mean, of course, never say never, right? But uh, it's because entering that headspace is really weird and, and disorienting, I think, and so. Um, I, I really, I felt like through the last draft of this, draft of this was really just kind of pulling myself across the finish line and like in, in a mental way. I don't know if that makes sense or if you've experienced that in your writing. Well, I, I feel like we assimilate really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. Like trying to access how, what, how you felt and what you did on a daily basis before you had an email address, mm -hmm. it's really hard. Yeah. You know? Sure. Once it was here, yeah. you know, it's like the old, uh, the old joke about, you know, we didn't even know we had it and then we're entitled to it. Yeah, you know? yeah exactly. You know, the guy getting pissed off on the plane because the Wi Fi went down. 
Yeah. You didn't have it last year. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You, you'll be all right. You'll yeah. make it. Yeah. 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 No, and it, it, it is, um, it, I mean, I'll, I'll, so part of, the, a part of this book takes place in Chicago in 1990, which is really the first time I think I've really written about a specific city set in a different time period, and I felt really, really nervous about that. Um, and I felt like I really had to nail down my research on that. So people who write like historical fiction, my hat is off to them because I just, I don't, I would be terrified to try and do that. Um, so it, it, in, in many ways, like the, you know, the billing stuff, the Montana stuff, that all feels a lot easier than kind of reaching into this other place where I wasn't there, right? So yeah, yeah, it's tricky. I remember so well that time because yeah. I was in Ottawa um, at a booking conference. I was working for the theater and was a booking conference. And a lot of my friends from Canada said, oh my gosh, what do people in the US think about our government's response to your, in, you know, this, remember how it happened. It yeah. was big. Yeah. And I said, oh. Nobody in the United States ever thinks about what, <laughs> thinks about what we're doing, yeah. particularly Canadians. Yeah. And it was so troubling to the people in Canada that this was happening. Yeah. And I didn't see that response anywhere mm -hmm. in the States. I mean, it was a weird, yeah. kind of creepy, we're doing the right thing and nobody's going to get killed because nobody's going there. We're just going to bomb everybody. Yeah, exactly. And that was the first, you know, we had the smart bombs, you know, we saw them on CNN with Wolf Blitzer, right? You know? God, yeah, it's really interesting. It, it, particularly because I feel like it was coming off of a period, late 70s, early 80s, where we were still kind of licking our wounds from Vietnam, you know, and I think we were in that kind of... Y exactly, yeah, exactly. No, absolutely. I mean, history just repeats itself. Um, so yeah, it's, it is very interesting, that, that, that perspective, for sure. Kelly Anderson, oh. online, one of your oh. far-off participants, says, and I just lost it, so give me a minute, okay. she says, big smiley face and says, well done. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> However, I don't know what she was telling you was well done. I think it's a general comment. Maybe just in general. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> but if Kelly would like to elaborate, I'll relay. Okay, all right, that sounds good. So I have a question. Yeah. So, and I'm glad you brought up the point of Chicago and the city because mm -hmm. growing up in Billings and it seems as though Billings has struggled to have an identity mm -hmm. and being able to identify itself within Montana and within the broader spectrum, spectrum of, of this region. Those of us that grew up in Billings, we can tell you what Billings is like. Mm -hmm. But people outside of Billings to tell us something that we're like, mm, yeah, no. Yeah, no, yeah. No. Um, so in your books, how did you and how do you find yourself identifying feelings oh. to others that, like, what do you think are the most identifying things to feelings so that people, like, ready can say, I could smell feelings. Yeah, that like, is. I know the smell of feelings. <laughs> right here, yeah. yeah. But, I don't want to tell anyone else that. You know, the, the, the beet, yeah. the sugar beet. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, at least in the fall and winter. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, I mean, that is such a great question. I mean, in, in some ways, I guess I've always thought of it as almost like what you're saying, like an empty canvas. Um, and I, I've always looked at that as a really positive thing. Um, where you, can, you know, there's so much, like from growing up here or living here, there's so much that you can gather and take and you're not really necessarily pigeonholed in any way. Um, yeah, so I've always kind of thought of it as a, a, like a blank canvas, but in that very kind of nice potential, like having that nice potential because it could be anything. It's not really, I mean, it's a college town, but it's not a college town and it's, you know, it's not a ski town, but it is a ski town, and it's, you know, it's not a hiking, camping, recreation town, but it is. I mean, it's all of those, you know, but it isn't one of them, yeah. you know? That's such a good answer. 
Oh, good. I was worried. About that. I was worried that was a terrible answer. It's almost like examples. Yeah. Examples you can describe billings, but you can't yeah. say it is a thing. It's, yeah. It just this is what people do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. But they do everything, right? right? If, you're, if you are stuck, people help you. Yeah. But they can't drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, this is what people do. Sure. And absolutely. When I was reading The Last Good Halloween, I was feeling everything I felt at that time in my life. I'm so excited about this one. I, thank you. Yeah, I know you've been, you've been jonesing for this. Yes, I know. Because of that. Yeah. You know, I know, Rini, you've been jonesing for this sequel for a long time, so this one I, I really need to dedicate to you. <laughs> I'd like to comment. Oh, excuse me, go ahead. Okay. So you don't plan to continue this uh, character, mm -hmm. but do you plan to bring Billings again in your new books? Well, so the next book that I'm working on um, is actually it's set in a fictional Montana town um, called Basic Montana which is a, a kind of a, a, a dying mi uh, mining town, um, which it's actually, I mean, it was funny because I just found this out about, from Jenny uh, the other day, it's geographically and historically, it's set in where present day Elkhorn, Montana is, which is essentially a ghost town, although we went there and there's still plenty of people living there. But, um, uh, but I didn't realize Jenny's family is from there. So, in fact, she sent me a picture of her and her sister, like, looking out of the window of that rusted out car. <laughs> it's right there. So, uh, that was really cool. So, in, to answer the question, I'll probably come back to Billings, um, for sure. Again, I mean, in terms of the writing. But right now, the, the one that's on my, the forefront of my, kind of, agenda, I guess, or whatever, is, is this other Montana town. So it's a different type. It's, it's, I'm trying to think of it as like maybe a cross between Pony Montana and Butte Montana, which may, I mean, it, I, I mean, well, you know, Butte's a lot bigger, but it's, it's maybe a, a big version of Pony or a small version of Butte. I don't know, something like that. Yeah. Going back to the smell of Billings, mm -hmm. I think that you guys are onto something, and it's more than just the sugar beets. Mm -hmm. I was on a three-week trip with my dog, and he slept most of the time, but we came in over that hill, mm -hmm. and he woke up and started looking yes. around and yep. sniffing, yeah. because yes. yep. even though our acceleration had not changed one bit, Interesting. he yes. smelled it, it woke him up, and there, there is something about how Billings smells. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, like, actually, I, I think that's true, because that happens with our dogs when we come back to visit visit my folks, and I, I mean, I, part of it, is I think it's the Yellowstone. Maybe. Like, I, I think, I mean, that's kind of the first thing that really greets you, and you get the, you know, the smell of the cottonwoods that are, you know, grow along the shore, and that kind of really sweet smell, and the, I don't know, I, I do, I really do firmly believe that. Yeah. So it is It is not just the sugar beet refinery, <laughs> <laughs> is, what, is what I think we're concluding Don't here. Don't short shrift to the two refineries. I mean, yeah. they, they do their part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. So. John, what is your writing process? Do you uh, write every day for a certain amount of time? Yes, okay. so, which I didn't used to do. Um, so re in the last, maybe two or three years, I've gotten into the habit of uh, waking up early, um, 5.45ish, and then, you know, kind of letting the dogs out, getting my coffee, and then writing for an hour, sometimes a little bit more if things are going well. And it's become kind of um, a ritual for me. Uh, so I'll, you know, and I kind of really play it up. I, I put on music, usually with something with no words. I'll usually light some incense, um, and just kind of, it, it's this very kind of quiet time. Yeah, and I used to not be, in graduate school, I was like a, a night owl, and then I think after that I did a lot where I would write um, kind of in giant stretches when I'd have a whole Friday or a whole Saturday, and so, but I'd become more of that kind of bit by bit writer, which suits me, I think, yeah. For now. Yeah, for now, exactly. But I, it, it's almost, for me, it's almost meditative. Um, you know, it's, it's it, yeah, Lisa's, yeah, you, you get it, right? Yeah. It's, I, I, I would like to get back to that, actually. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's, I find it to be such a good kind of mental preparation for the day, you know, before things get kind of chaotic and crazy. Um, yeah, so I, that's kind of been my new thing, I guess. Did you, did you have a question back there? Well, I was going to ask what other like social or political events were happening in 1980 that were like the big changes, uh, other than the war. And the only thing I can remember about the war is I wish we would have waited until the UN to decide to you know, keep them out of Kuwait. Yeah, that's right. I mean, well, I mean, there was that. You know, I, I think of uh, you know there pre, prior to that there was. The action, not war, the action we had in Panama, which um, to oust Manuel Noriega, which I also think was kind of a little bit of a trial run for a lot of what was happening. I mean, I just feel like they were kind of little, uh, little kind of n n small pieces of things that were happening that just, again, I, I don't know why, and I think this is me just kind of critiquing myself where I feel like I wasn't aware of those things. Yeah, I know, I know, I was only 17. But I don't know, I just, I feel like we kind of accepted them without really asking questions about them, you know? I, but, I mean, that's, I guess, the other, you know, that's the other thing that I think maybe was on, politically on my mind with this a little bit, but, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yes. I mean, the 80s were old. Yes. And MTV had become ubiquitous. Yes. And, yes. and, you know, it was everybody put your best shirts away and put your flannel on. And <laughs> well, not, not yet. No, no, not until uh, winter of 91. <laughs> and Nirvana finally come and told yes. boy. That's right. <laughs> so, there it needed to happen. Uh, so. It was it was a it was a it was a mercy killing. Yes. Uh, the um, I will say uh, I'm trying to not spoil stuff, but I will say there is a s Easter egg appearance by a very famous '90s band at the very end of this book in Chicago. So I'll just leave that for people to figure out. They're not mentioned, just the names of the actual band members. Yes? What about Chicago? You've lived there and been away from Billings longer than you have in Billings. Yeah. So, but you don't, your heart isn't yeah, there it's, coming out intentionally. Yeah, it's very, I still find it really hard to write about Chicago. Um, I, I can and I have, and I, I can do it set in, in present tense. But it's really hard, and I, maybe it's just my writing style tends more toward like the natural world and the naturalistic. So I feel like it's hard for me to write those types of narratives. Or your formative years were so great. Yeah. That you are, that that's a different yeah, exactly. I do. I think that's true. Yeah, it's funny though. How I've, long have you been away from Billings? I mean, I've lived in Chicago since 2004, so. Yeah, I mean, it's a long time now, and I very little of what I've written has been set there. A couple short stories. Do you know um, Robert Eater? Who? Robert Eater. He has like 27 books. Oh my god. He's from Billings and okay. from Chicago. Oh, really? He Elder. does. Elder? Elder. Oh, Rob Elder, Elder. yes. Elder. Oh, yeah, we've had. We've had Elder. Yeah, we've had, we've had brunch at their house, and oh. yeah. We, um, there's a uh, Keir Graf. Do you know Keir? He, yeah, I think he's from Missoula. He lives in Chicago as well. He edited Montana Noir, that anthology. Yeah, and somehow someone said, I saw that there was a, a reading for that in Chicago. I was like, Montana Noir, wait, what? And so I somehow ended up getting connected with Keir, and um, he has, uh, the, the, he kind of co-runs this, this publishing cocktails thing in Chicago. So I've gone to that a couple times, and that was where I met Rob Elder, who's from Billings, went to senior. Um, his mom was the dean at Billings Senior High, and she told him that I was a good student, and that, I would, that, that I, was okay to, I was okay to hang out with in Chicago. That was, that was his direct words. Uh, so yeah, so we, we've, seen, we, we've spent some time together. We haven't since COVID, but, but prior to that, we, we have.
have. So it's a, it's a, it's a cool, uh, there's, there is a little clutch of Montana writers in Chicago. So, yeah. I have a question oh, yeah. about audience. Yes. Sure. But your main character is a kid. Yes. And you know, Elisa has run into this too. Like she had, similar to you, a spin off story from a previous book, oh. but the character who spoke to her was a youngster. And yeah. so, you know, publishers don't know what to do with these sorts of books mm -hmm. where the, the, the clear audience is really adults who yeah. like the previous books. Mm -hmm. But like with the characters, a teenager, I don't know what to do with this. Yeah. So, Oh, yeah, I mean, that, that is, I wrestle with that all the time with, with my first novel and with this one as well. Um, I never set out with a young audience in mind. I, and I think, I think that was, I'm happy that I made that choice. Um, it is, it's very, very realistic in my, from my point of view to what being a teenager was like at that time. Um, Sometimes I think some of the, the 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 books that are geared toward young adult it projects a sanitized version of young adultness um, that I don't feel is authentic to what it was like to be a young adult for me, um, and so that's why I've always tried to approach it with a kind of um, you know just a more kind of uh, uh, gimlet-eyed view. Um, I think that was probably the, one of the difficulties that I had with finding a publisher for the first one. Um, you know, I had an agent for it who just really, really had a hard time finding a place because it, it, it didn't fall neatly into those, you know, the bucket of young adult or, or I think there's a, n a new one, Mark and I were talking, new adult is a, is a, a term, so, which I hadn't even, I don't think they had that one when I wrote my first novel, so. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. Can I change to being yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. right? Aren't we all kind of new adults? Um, yeah, yeah. So, so it's I wrestle with it all the time, and and you know, um, when this one came out, my publisher was very. I mean, they kind of they definitely labeled it young adult, and and that's where they feel it, it fits, and and I'm I'm happy with that. That's fine with me. Um, I would say it's probably not for all, you know, young adults. It's it's definitely got some, you know, some salty language in it and, and things like that. But yeah, it's it's a really interesting. I mean, I'm not going to call it a conundrum, but it is an interesting question. This is something when people ask me this, I often ask them, well, do you think Catcher in the Rye is young adult, mm -hmm. right? And um, it. it if it were published today, it, it undoubtedly would be billed as that, you know, but, or how, fin yeah, exactly, any of those, yeah. Um, and yet, I don't feel like that they're necessarily, were written with that audience in mind. Yeah, it's really interesting, though. Yeah, yeah I have a book seller perspective, it gets really tricky. Yeah, yeah. Like, sure. Where do we put it in the store? Yeah. Sure that the right audience happens upon it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. perspicacious to find it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Really it's, for, it's for us. Yeah. And, and I do think, like, I do think that this book and the previous one, I feel like if I had read the, those as a teenager, I would have I would have felt less alone in the world. Like, I, I feel like that's kind of the best thing you can find when you're that age in reading. Yeah. Why don't we adopt the Michael Chabon model, which was, he said if he owned a bookstore, he would have two sections, good books, <laughs> bad books, and he wouldn't stop the second section. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, good, yeah. good genre distinction. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. 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 Well, Looking for a good book. Yeah. 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 It's just something that agents and marketers yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. put on the artists. Like, yeah. We need to be able to type you so that we yeah. can sell mm -hmm. you and so that you can pay your bills and we get money too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, it's it's not something and I'm happy that it's not something that you 
really yeah. from that, you don't work from that perspective. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I, I do think, you know, you're right, Sarah, where it, the, I think a lot of the industries, like, like publishing or, or other ones like that, they're very risk averse. So yes. no one wants to publish a book about a boy wizard until, like, s someone sells a bajillion copies of books about a boy wizard and then, like, we can't get enough. You know, we need a, a boy wizard genre. Uh, so, uh, I, I mean, I do think that that is really, you, you, you hit it on the head where it's just they, if they know, if, if there's a bucket that they know sells, then, you know, we'll, we'll do anything from that. But it's really hard if it doesn't fit something like that. Well, and I think also just when you're writing, that despite all the writing teachers who tell you you should be thinking about audience, I just find for me personally, I really can't tell the very mm -hmm. You know, when I'm, when I'm closer to that publication time, then I'm thinking about who the audience is going to be. But yeah. It always starts with what What do I want to read? What's yeah. Me turning the page, where is my experience coming from? Where is my yeah. emotional thread here? Yeah. And then, when it's time to submit it to my agent, then I start to say, well, who's it here for? I think this is possibly yeah. Sure. And, and I mean, so you're talking after uh, definitely after a first draft. I mean, you would oh, never. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, yeah, yeah good, right. good. Yeah. I mean, when I'm in the first draft, it's, I really can't think about yeah, it. Yeah, so you got to put the blinders on. Yeah, 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 for sure. It's really where, where in me is this reflected, and where, where am I connecting? Where is what's going to keep me turning the page? And mm -hmm. It's really until I'm well in the revision stage that I start envisioning who the reader is. And yeah. more often than not, I have the person in mind. Yeah. Reading. Yeah. Um, and even then, I can really only limit it to like one person. To, you know. That's yeah. A very very small. Sure. Sure. Group. And, and then, is Craig yeah. not? Craig isn't that reader then. No. I'm okay. Not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But but and, and even then, I'm always kind of disappointed that it's like, oh, it's women's fiction. Oh it's yeah. Always Yeah. Half right. Three. Yeah, I just you bristle. I, yeah, I bristle yeah. at that. I'm glad you do too. Yeah, it's yeah, just. I do. Yeah. Johnny, you said something that really resonated with me. You said that if you'd read this when you were the age of the um, mm. Kirby and the story, you would have felt this alone. And I think that, like, one of the reasons it resonated with me so much is I could feel the same emotions and knowing that other people that I knew felt it too. Yeah. And whether or not they talked about it, or mm -hmm. it but. but you wrote something that I remember feeling. Oh, yeah. You, you wrote something I remember seeing, I remember smelling, I remember feeling. Yeah. You, you wrote that. Yeah. And, and what, that, what they told us as we were growing up is that you know, we, we thought that the grown-ups had everything figured out. Yeah. And that we were going to be okay. And, and your book was like reading it at that age, like, you know what? It might not. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But it's true. I mean, sure. that, that's almost like, yeah. Having this expectation of all these things going to work out, it's like, no, you know what? Yeah. You're going to have to fight. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And that's something that for, for a kid going through some stuff, mm -hmm. and just because I didn't relative to others, other people do. Yeah. And just knowing that you're not alone, that, that's, I think that was very powerful. No, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. That means a lot that you felt that way too. Yeah. And I think, I think we're also kind of hardwired. I mean, you know, and this, I actually haven't talked about it much with this book, but I remember with my first book, like, uh, it, you know, it's a first person narrator. And so I think you get a lot of like deep interiority with the character. And I think boys in particular are kind of taught not to share those thoughts and those feelings they're having and those, those concerns. And so, um, so I think it is really easy to feel, I mean, I'm sure girls, it's the same way. Um, but I do think there's this kind of like, you know, be stoic, be strong, stoic type of um, uh, kind of uh, urging that we get. And so I think it's, it's even, it can be really pronounced if you're not exposed to that in any way. Yeah, that's interesting. So, that was really awesome. <laughs> <A> cool <laughs> conversation. I mean, I could go all night, but I don't think anyone wants to. <laughs> uh, so um, thank you all for coming. This is just like a dream come true for me to be here to do this and to have all of you here. So thank you very, very much.
This has been a production of This House of Books.